Hey everyone, Chris Kresser here. Welcome to another episode of Revolution Health Radio. This week I'm really excited to welcome Dr. Robert Barrett and Dr. Louis Franceschetti as my guest. Dr. Barrett has spent much of his life studying behavior, group dynamics, and organizational culture, and his primary focus is on why we do the things we do and how individuals and teams can reach top performance. Dr. Franceschetti is an emergency and preventative medicine physician, a university professor, and an international speaker. He trained in preventative medicine at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore and is past president of the Canadian Medical Association and past president of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. And what we're going to be talking about today is their recent book, Hardwired, How Our Instincts to Be Healthy Are Making Us Sick. Uh, This is obviously a very interesting topic for me as someone who has paid a lot of attention to the influence of evolution on all aspects of our behavior, from how we eat, to how we sleep, to how we exercise or or don't, to how we interact with digital devices that are uh, becoming an increasingly large part of our lives. So uh, I've been looking forward to this interview, really enjoyed it, and I hope you will too. Let's dive in. Dr. Barrett and Dr. Francis Scuddy, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. Welcome. Thanks, Thanks for, for having us on. Me. So this was actually, a, a, I got your, a copy of your book, I think from your publicist. I get lots of books all the time, as you can imagine, uh, in the mail. A lot of them, frankly, um, don't get read and end up in the recycling bin because um, I'm not interested. But when I see a book that's called Hardwired, How Our Instincts to Be Healthy Are Making Us Sick, you know, that got my attention right away because this, of course, is an area of interest of mine, uh, how evolution has shaped our behavior and continues to shape our behavior and, and the impacts of that, both positive and negative. So uh, how did you arrive at the idea of hardwired instincts? You both come from different backgrounds. Um, so I'm curious, you know, how you arrived at this concept and then how you teamed up and decided to write, a, write this book. Yeah, I can start off with that one. Um, well, coming from different backgrounds, uh, we see that as a as a pretty distinct uh, opportunity and advantage uh, in putting these ideas together. Um, we uh, I'll start with the the second question, which is how do we start working together? We're both basically asking the same question: Why do we do the things that we do? Um, Louis is a uh, an ER uh, doc and professor. As an ER doc, of course. Uh, um, he sees things uh, from a pretty serious side uh, when we talk about why we do the, the silly things that we do. For me, as a social scientist, I'm looking at society and conflict and decisions making and judgment and all that. And putting it together, uh, we found that there was a, a kind of a gap that was happening with respect to understanding our health, with, with uh, looking at how society is changing uh, very, very quickly, and uh, and how the uh, and how our deteriorating health uh, situation, which is manifesting in, in various fronts, uh, how those two things play together. And uh, we looked at it uh, from the the point of view that our our society around us, uh, our modern world, is changing at such a rapid pace that it seems to be outpacing some of our ability to stay in front of it uh, in terms of our, uh, our survival drives. So these things are always active um, and they never stop, of course, but we, have, we are now in this world of, of plenty and uh, it's almost uh, in an overload situation and that's having some serious consequences with respect to our health. So the, the question is, uh, you know, the, the underlying uh, question then is, is that these are our instincts that are evolved to help us survive and, and help us stay healthy. But uh, in our current rapidly changing world, uh, what is actually happening is, is the opposite. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Christopher, uh, just to simplify it for your listeners, um, you know, Rob and I believe that humans are running on outdated software. I mean, the software yeah. that's kept us alive for millions of years is not working in the uh, current environment. And, it was uh, designed for different hardware and circumstances, right? Exactly. And that's why in the States, especially, I think uh, the uh, tribalism that you're seeing right now, um, I, I mean, I know it's a brutal word to use, but um, it's all driven by social media and social media uh, is not the way our brain is designed to work. And the people that have figured out how to use social media to reward, reward the brain with uh, dopamine uh, have got them hooked. And you can listen to people that have almost been 
I don't want to say brainwashed, but uh, they've kind of been brainwashed and given a little patch to mm -hmm. update their uh, outdated software. And some of us, you know, the haves of society have been able to figure out how to create our own patches. But uh, COVID has shown us that, uh, you know, th th there's a whole different response out there if you know how to survive in the 21st century versus not survive. Right. So I want to I want to talk, of course, about uh, the, the health implications of this, which you cover in your book. But as I was uh, learning a little bit more about about you, Louis, I came across an interview that you did way back in 2014. I mean, it's, it's not way back. It's, uh, <laughs> it does seem like a different era about uh, cell phone free driving. And that seems to be a really interesting example of the conflict between you know, what our, our brains were designed for and the evolutionary patterns um, that would have kept protected survival and in in natural fitness in an in a ancestral environment. And then the impact that, that those tendencies have when we're subjected to, let's say, a smartphone and beeping and flashing while we're driving a heavy uh, metal vehicle. So yeah. maybe we could start there and talk a little sure. bit about that as, as just a doorway to understanding this mismatch between our genes and biology and our current environment. Yeah, Chris, that's a perfect example. And uh, we were ahead of the curve. Like we were warning people that this was dangerous before you know, this, uh, the evidence showed us that it was dangerous. And simply yeah. because it's not the conversation that's the distraction. It, 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 it's not, no, sorry. It's not whether your hands held or hands free that's distract. It's the conversation that's the distraction. Because as you mentioned, for millions of years, through storytelling, we've been able to share where the food, the water, the fire, the shelter, the mates, you know, the enemies were. And storytelling allowed us to put a real premium to it. So when you hear another person's voice, 60% of your brain, and this has been shown with, you know, PET scans, is activated. And so your attention is to the conversation. And, you know, a passenger will adjust their conversation through what's known as conversation stalling. If they see that you're driving fast, merging, you know, you don't have uh, good vision, the weather's bad. But when, if we were to try and do this interview now and I'm driving, I mean, I'm so focused on trying to give you a good interview. I'll be in a state of inattention blindness where I'll run over a kid. And when the police officer says, didn't you see the kid? I will honestly say, no, I didn't because I was in right. a state of inattention blindness. And that's hardwired. We're hardwired to be social creatures and to listen to other voices. And we're also hardwired to be distractible, right? Because if we, in a, in a different context, if we're, you know, let's say sitting in a, in a, in a prairie or a savanna, and then off to in our peripheral vision, we see some movement that could be a predator that might be stalking us and ready to kill us. So we, it, our, our, maybe our ancestors who were hyper-focused on whatever they were doing in that savanna didn't survive to pass on their genes while our ancestors who were distractible by that you know, movement in the peripheral field did survive and passed on their genes. So I wonder how that also impacts you know, uh, our lives in a world where you cannot escape the distractions and they just seem to be multiplying every year yeah uh, yeah i can uh, step in there we we see that in, in manifesting you know several different ways um the, the distraction point uh, one aspect of that is is as louis had mentioned is that we get this brain reward our reward system you know lights up uh with uh, dopamine and oxytocin we know there's studies that tell us what percentages those increase when you when you get a your phone vibrates in your pocket or you get a, a like on social media these are very very real and then some of the demographic sectors that are most affected by this say uh, the adolescents and young adults who are most predisposed to uh, their social peer group and that that is they make their decisions based on what their peers think of them um, they are hyper focused on this and it's also mm -hmm. a stage from an evolutionary standpoint that we would have been going out to seek mates and we would have been taking risks to go and and maybe leave our village to go seek seek a mate so this is this is also part of this hard wiring that's built in and we're always socially comparing ourselves to others we see that of course we all see it in social media there is this underlying 
social ascendancy that is always there that's that creeps into all the posts where people are you know kind of comparing themselves to everyone else and that creates a lot of anxiety as well so you have all this dopamine and oxytocin which is you say hey well that's that's pretty good you know your brain feeds off of this and that's what we're uh, evolved to do but this, at the flip side of it you have the anxiety and the depression and everything else that comes with the fact that we are glued to these devices and it's it creates almost a fight or flight in us that we can't escape from i think it's uh, the reason i like talking about this topic and having this conversation and i always like to pause and and point this out is that there's such a in my experience as a clinician you know over a decade treating patients with chronic disease there's such guilt and and shame and and self blame are are very common and explaining to people the evolutionary roots of their behavior is it's not meant to absolve them of responsibility technically meaning the ability to respond appropriately mm -hmm. in that situation but to maybe take a little bit of the individual burden off of you know like the idea that there's something wrong with them and they're you know weak or lack willpower or or you know it's some individual failing rather than they're actually acting out their biological programming in exactly the way that they were designed to do. Mm -hmm. That's right. And we talk about the idea of resilience. Um, it's a very popular word and I'm not discounting it, but there is something to be said for uh, the idea that we are constantly saying, Hey, you just have to be more resilient. You just have to push harder against um, all of those, uh, you know, all the dopamine and all the, all the biological urges you have. There has to be a smarter way of doing this than just saying, you know, you need to be stronger and, and push mm -hmm. back all the bad stuff and right. taking all the good stuff and, and understanding, as you say, understanding the mechanisms that are driving that behavior is, is a great first step just to being able to understand it. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit more about some of those mechanisms and how they're affecting our health. Um, a couple of years ago, we started seeing studies coming out suggesting that for the first time in modern recorded history uh, that we're aware of, other than short periods like the, the 1918 pandemic and uh, the war periods, life expectancy, which had pretty much been on a linear uh, increase, has actually declined. And I know there, there's some debate about the how much this has happened and what the causes of that might be, but I'd love to hear uh, your take on this. I mean, you know, what's what's actually going on here? I, I know it's it's more pronounced in certain demographics or parts of the population than others. And and how does this relate to the hardwired hypothesis? I can start out, and then Louis can uh, can polish it off. Um, so the the book we talk about certain sectors of the population are experiencing a decline in lifespan, and as you say. Um, this is extremely unusual. Um, what we saw was that among many industrialized countries, there was a dip in lifespan, but the U.S., but while most have recovered, the U.S. had been particularly uh, hard hit. And in some sectors of the population, uh, we haven't really seen a full uh, recovery from this loss of, of lifespan. And, and the sectors that have been particularly hard are those who are um, less educated, um, they are uh, less wealthy, uh, and there are also ones that uh, where we are seeing uh, particularly uh, strong evidence of, of, um, of lower lifespans are, are in the midlife category, and and these have to do with behaviors. It's 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 really um, interesting that that opioids, um, prescription drug medications, um, and alcoholism and smoking, uh, if you can believe it's still in there, um, that these are actually affecting um, midlife mortality. And they're and they're coined as as uh, deaths of despair. So they have mm -hmm. they have a psychological element to them. Um, and Louis sees a lot of this firsthand in the in the ER as well. And maybe I'll let him uh, round out the answer on this. Yeah, Chris, and uh, I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. I mean, we're not over this opioid crisis, and yeah. that's driving a lot of this. And also, uh, as you know, you know, unfortunately, when kids die and motor vehicle collisions and they do autopsies and they look at the coronary arteries, uh, there's plaque. I mean, there is plaque like they've never seen before. And so we're raising a generation of kids that, you know, are, are not quite as healthy as they used to be in the past. And then, you know, the uh, World Health Organization was right on when they predicted that by 2020, depression would surpass a lot of other chronic illnesses. 
And when we see the, uh, the burden of mental illness amongst our young people, um, the rise in suicide rates, uh, latest CDC numbers I saw show a slight decline. But uh, as a university professor, just the other night, my class was talking about, uh, you know, suicides amongst university students. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the last thing is, uh, there's a reason why the UK uh, created a ministry of loneliness, because loneliness is worse for your health than smoking. Um, I mean, yes. and I never thought I'd say that, but, you know, being lonely on a day-to-day -day basis is actually worse for your health than smoking. So, you know, there's a lot of room for improvement and, uh, you know, thank goodness for guys like yourself and others that are out there that, you know, understand we've got to approach this very differently. It's not as if we have to spend more money. I mean, especially in the States. I mean, right. <laughs> you, yeah. you guys spend we spend more than three enough trillion money. dollars a year. It's yeah, that, it's a question right. of how that money is being deployed. Right. That's right. And so all, all, all these things combined, um, you know, made us, you know, say, we've got to share this information with others. So Rob and I used to do talks together on safety for mm -hmm. industry. And people would always say, well, you guys have got such great ideas. Why don't you write a book? And, and so you know, that's, that's where the genesis <laughs> of the we book are. came. Yeah. Yeah. Let's dive a little deeper into depression and particularly um, with uh, for adults as well, but also adolescents and teens. We've touched on it briefly, the impact that social media may have. I'd like to to hear both of your take on why you think depression is rising and how that relates to the hardwired concept and and then the role that that social media plays there. Okay. Rob, you want Rob, you want to talk about Rosetto and Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh sure. Uh so first of all, um you know, we all we all instinctively feel that you know our the world is shifting beneath our feet and uh um, it's not just COVID. I mean, this this predates COVID. Um, so, you know, the, the way that we communicate, the way that we interact uh, is getting faster. There's more expected of us. Uh, and that ha a lot of that happens on social media. So we see that social media, as we talked about, has this strong social comparison element to it. And if you are if you think about a uh, rungs on a ladder, if, if you're not on the top rung or you don't perceive yourself to be on the top rung, then you're somewhere uh, less than where you think you should be. And, and for a lot of us, that's not satisfying. And we, we tend to be, uh, tend to, tends to create anxiety and an expectation that we should, you know, do better compared to our peers. And everybody on social media is putting their best foot forward and we're constantly comparing ourselves. And that causes in itself a lot of anxiety. Now we're on our a lot of that social media is we're on our phones all the time. Um, and Louis mentioned Rosetto, and that's a that is a community that was studied uh, in in depth. Uh, that was uh, in Pennsylvania, where they had an, a near absence of coronary uh, heart disease, and uh, it was it was a, a total anomaly. Trying to figure out why this was the case, and it was an, it was a community of an Italian immigrants that had really hard jobs working in mining sector. Um, they lived hard. They worked hard. They uh, their diets weren't especially great. They drank you know copious amounts of wine, the whole bit, and yet they had this great cardiac profile. And uh, one of the 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 after much study, um, the conclusion was that it was the the sense of community that uh, really helped alleviate that stress level, that anxiety, and potentially depression. And I think we all inherently understand that if our community, and this may go back as well to our evolutionary history, if, our, if we sense that our community has our back, that we are able to rely on them uh, when times are tough, we, it feels good. It feels good to us and it lowers our stress levels. If we feel mm -hmm. that we're out there in the wind all by ourselves and we're worrying about tomorrow every day, um, that's, that's anxiety uh, inducing. So that was the case with Rosetto that they had this sense of strong community. They looked after each other um, and it lowered their, their stress and anxiety. The opposite is happening on social media. And the, now the book is much more than social media, but that is one of the, obviously the, the leading ways that we see that our world is, uh, is rapidly changing around us. Right. So Louis, you mentioned loneliness and I'm, I'm familiar. Uh, I actually covered uh, perhaps the study you were referring to in my first book. It, you know, it's more dangerous than smoking 15 cigarettes a day, having high BMI, uh, you know, a whole bunch of other risk factors that we would typically think would be much more serious. Yeah. 
and it there's just been more and more research pointing in that direction since then and and I think the average American now has less than one confidant or you know person that they can feel like they, they can confide in I'm curious what you you guys think about the the influence of social media on loneliness you know across all age groups because on the one hand on the surface maybe if you don't look too deeply you could say oh you know now we have the capacity to like make connections with hundreds or thousands of people. Whereas in a Paleolithic environment, it might've been, you know, 70 to a hundred people total that we would ever know in our lifetime. So how, you know, how, how could that contribute to loneliness? But there's, there's a little bit more to this, to the story, isn't there? Yeah. I, I mean, we all know that it takes um, about 40 adults to raise a child properly. And uh, if you look back, um, that's exactly what extended families had, you know, about 40. And then Robert Putman uh, wrote that book on bowling alone that started warning us that uh, we don't want to do things together anymore. And I don't think people noticed that book and the importance of it. And then, you know, we, we do a chapter in the book on happiness uh, because happiness is something that everyone's striving for. But I mean, if happiness was 100%, we're, what is it? 50% of it is genetic you either have it or you don't. So you can't do much about that. You can only get about 10% happier by uh, being wealthy or having stuff. And I always worried about people that need to have a lot of brand or brands around them, like Louis Vuitton, Gucci, BMW, Mercedes, Mont Blanc, because you're not buying those uh, things for yourself. You're buying them for others. So others look at you and like Rob said, think that you're important. Um, all you have to do is travel around the world and uh, after you meet somebody for the very first time and you talk about the weather, what's the first thing that they ask about you? They want to know what you do for a living. And by that, they establish what social status you have and whether they want to talk to you or not. But, you know, your listeners should know that there's something immediately in their control that can make them 40 percent happier, 40 percent happier. And that's volunteering. And the reason it is is because volunteering then puts you in contact, like you said, uh, with real people, with real lives, and that you can uh, connect with them. And it gives you a feeling of doing something and uh, you get these immediate, immediate benefits. I still volunteer. And actually yesterday I was volunteering for um, a palliative care residence that we created. In the last two years, we raised $16 million, opened a 12 bed freestanding unit. Anyone can go in there free of charge and have the best experience for their last days. And I'm helping them set up a program and I'm doing it all for free. And you know what, when I left there, I was going, man, that made me feel good. And so if your listeners have not volunteered, get them to volunteer and they'll see this immediate, immediate sense of, wow, that feels good. And that feel good is uh, what then builds into other things, making them healthier, reducing stress in their life, or reducing inflammation. And the list just goes on and on. I, you touched on something, I mean, with volunteering, of course, that I'd love to know if you, you, if you both have looked into in any depth, is, which is, is meaning. Um, one of my favorite books ever is Viktor Frankl's uh, Man's Search for Meaning. And I, I'm familiar with uh, some research on meaning and and uh, the relationship between meaning or lack of meaning and mental health and behavioral health. I'm wondering how that figures into your work, if, if yeah. it does. Well, I, I can summarize that with this one beautiful saying that, uh, you know, somebody taught me a long time ago was the two most important days of your life are the day you're born and the day you figure out why. So, you know, the sooner people can figure out why they were put here on earth, and start living that dream, uh, the sooner that they're going to be a complete individual. So, you know, this isn't just platitudes. I mean, Rob and I, you know, live this stuff. And, uh, you know, I have a lot of folks that I mentor. And once they start putting these pieces into place, it's like, oh, my gosh, is it really that simple? And, you know, once you have your base of Maslow hierarchy needs met, um, yes, it is really that simple. Um, we just have to regain that sense of purpose. And I'm really, really, really hopeful that after COVID, just like after the plague, they went through the Renaissance, that we're going to be going through a period that baby boomers are going to say, well, I've got to do something different with my life. 
Baby boomers now are retiring. They have time, energy, money, experience. And if we can get this generation um, to really collectively decide it's time to do something for each other, I think there's going to be great things happening as we come out of COVID. I feel very positive and energized by it all. I'm happy to hear that. So I want to I want to shift gears a little bit and talk um, about some broader factors. Uh, one that's particularly relevant to COVID, and I think where we are in this moment in time with COVID specifically, um, which is risk homeostasis, uh, risk tolerance, how we think about and evaluate risk. You know, we're at this point now where there's, I see a kind of broad distinction between two different approaches or proposed approaches to, um, you know, navigating the next stage of this pandemic, one of which might be referred to as zero COVID, you know, the, the goal to, to drive down cases to zero and basically do whatever is necessary um, to make that happen. And I would submit a, an example of this as the um, policy by uh, the municipality of Peel, which I believe is near Toronto in Canada. You guys are yeah, Canadian, yes. right? Yeah. Um, which was recommending that kid, even young children at the daycare age, if they were exposed to COVID, be physically isolated in their bedrooms with no contact with anybody else in the household as a way of you know reducing transmission. And then on you have on a, as a different approach, harm reduction strategy, which uh, is more aimed at, you know, reducing the overall amount of harm that could be caused by COVID. And that's not just reducing cases, but that's also looking at other harms like social isolation and economic harms and things like that. And it seems to me that that's really the crux of it at this point, but that human, I don't know whether this is an innate trait, I'm, this is what I want your opinion on, or whether it's societal or where we are in time, but, but we're, we're really not good at evaluating risk uh, mm -hmm. of COVID and then contextualizing that versus other risks that um, we take on a regular basis. So I'm, I'm just curious, because I know you, you both, you've written about risk homeostasis and this idea in your book. So I'm, I'm curious mm -hmm. about your thoughts on that. Well, I'll, uh, I'll start out on that one. And then I'll let maybe let Louis talk about uh, some of the interventions with COVID at the societal level. First of all, risk uh, homeostasis, and, and I, I imagine your listeners are, are quite uh, converse with uh, some of these terms, but uh, in case they're not, we're talking homeostasis, of course, meaning that the ability to maintain that proper equilibrium. So when we talk about it in the book, and, and there are many ways, of course, to understand why we do the things that we do and how we make those risk judgments. But the one that we tended to prefer and, and talk about was the risk homeostasis, which is the sense that um, if you are in an environment where you sense that it is uh, not very risky, then you adjust your behavior uh, to uh, take, be slightly more aggressive and to take more risk. And that brings you back up into a kind of a happy zone for risk. And conversely, say if you're driving your car and it's a snowstorm and you can't see very well, well, you're going to adjust your behavior, behavior back um, and, and make it uh, more conservative in a sense that you are going to reduce that risk level back into your happy place. So it's your behavior then is, is changing that risk so that you're, that you're happy with that. So, so that's, that's part of the, uh, the equation. And we, we see that happening over and over. We give lots of examples in the book about how that, that plays out in our day-to-day -day lives. But the other side of the equation, which is really interesting, and if we get into some of the judgments that we make on COVID, is how we're getting how we're getting the information today, and not to go back to media all the time, um, but uh, in the book we talk about the fact that if you have the internet, um, you have at your fingertips, you know, uh, tens of thousands of of, uh, of of articles that have to do with uh, medicine, for example, how to live a better life, but yet we we often uh, default to, you know, what somebody said on Twitter, um, you know, some, uh, perhaps a celebrity said something about a diet, uh, we jump on this. So it's, it's also how we get our information. We're not going through and reading all of these abstracts to try to make an informed decision on, on the risk that we take in our lives and the behavior. It's, we're getting this from little sound bites. And that's part of the, the danger in terms of how we decide to um, make judgments on, on handling big things like, like COVID. In, in Canada, 
for example, we've seen a lot of the decisions that have to do, uh, that come down to, you know, what is the public thinking about this? Or is the public concerned right now about this? Well, well let's steer the policy to make sure that that, that is part of our, our policy platform. Now, the public may not be necessarily getting all of their information from, you know, the, the, the best sources. Um, and so that's part of the equation as well. Um, so I'll let Louis finish the, finish the uh, round out the answer on that one again. again. Yeah. Chris, I think your uh, listeners just need to Google uh, Taiwan and the number of cases of uh, <laughs> COVID deaths in Taiwan. I'm finding there's nine deaths and 955 cases. The U.S. has got like 29 million cases and uh, half a million deaths. So yes. risk assessment, when SARS showed up, Taiwan listened very carefully to what the scientists were saying about how to handle the next pandemic. And the moment they got wind that uh, from Wunan, which they had dozens of daily flights going from Taiwan to the epicenter of the pandemic, they were able to activate a system that was based on risk assessment and control it so that you know, Taiwan society today is operating uh, normally. And the, the, the figures speak for themselves. So that's why I said earlier, it's not as if we need more money to solve these problems. What we need is a new kind of thinking. And what we need is some um, leaders that are not only visionary, but they're innovators and willing to take risks. It's 2021, we have all the answers as to what we need to do. Uh, we just don't have the willingness, unfortunately, to do it. So. That's why we appreciate the opportunity to, you know, challenge people to think differently than the way they've been thinking up to now. Yeah, I was going to. I'll add one thing too there as well. It, we see this. And Louis mentioned that we've done work on on the safety world as well. Uh, in the safety world, in the conflict world, uh, and in the health world, prevention is is tough, and it seems to be a tough sell. And it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be a tough sell. And Louis talks about thinking differently. So right now, and um, you know, this speaks to much of your work as well, Chris. Uh, you know, we should be spending much more of our effort into primary, um, you know, prevention, and but we spend so much of it in secondary and and, and third, you know, where we uh, are detecting a disease and then we're trying to manage the disease. But you know, can we do something before we even have to detect the disease? Can we do something at the prevention level? And that is a is part of our risk uh, assessment. It's a huge part of it. And whether you're in the safety world or whether you're in the health world or the conflict uh, mitigation world, um, those are tough. And uh, we have to do a better job at trying to figure out how to make that a viable sell and, and sell that to people. I, I always try and tell politicians, just remember three numbers, three, four, and 50. You know, three risk factors, smoking inactivity and poor nutrition contribute to four major diseases, certain cancers, diabetes, respiratory illnesses and cardiovascular illness. And that accounts for 50%, 5-0% of the total health burden. And, you know, on any given year in North America, it's only about five or 6% of the population that's consuming 65% of resources. So it's not as if we don't know what to do. We just need yeah. to do it, you know? Well, that, I mean, this is why I have become so interested in health coaching as a modality because uh, information is not enough to change behavior. <laughs> we, we know that now, or we should know it now. You know, we have about 6% of people who follow the top five health behaviors that have been identified by the CDC on a regular basis. And it's, I, it's not because people don't know that they shouldn't be smoking or they shouldn't be drinking excessively or they shouldn't be eating, you know, highly processed and refined foods. It's that that knowledge is not enough to change behavior. And I think, again, this goes right back to your hypothesis, hardwired. So, you know, what's happening here? And given, you know, if we accept that premise that it's not about information, it's about overcoming this, this hardwiring that, again, protected our survival in a natural and, you know, in an ancestral environment, but is, is actively, you know, harming it today. What is the way forward um, well, if it's not just information? Yeah, I, I think that we've got to look at uh, soda drinks and junk food as the equivalent of the cigarette when we discovered just how bad cigarettes were for us. I mean, you know, there's an industry out there that uh, has figured out, you know, every last possible combination for salt, fat and sugar, and uh, we've fallen for it. 
And uh, what we need to do is um, understand that we, we have to approach it uh, similar to how we approached uh, tobacco and uh, tobacco companies. You know, there's a lot of people out there that um, are addicted to disease and the more disease, the better. And so what we need to do is break that addiction to disease. And that's why we dedicated a whole chapter to how dangerous hospitals were to try and get people to realize you really don't want to go to a hospital unless you absolutely have to. Um, you know, Rob can talk about uh, just how dangerous hospitals are. I, I've got to be careful talking about it working in one. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's probably, the hand that feeds you. Yeah, it's probably best that Rob <laughs> talk about it. But I can tell right. you, you know, these accredited facilities are killing people. So it talks to you about accreditation and the value of it, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, part, just to answer or to add to what Louis was saying too, um, with the last one, is that, uh, yeah, you know, you look at obviously the, you know, the, the sugar industry and the, uh, you know, pushing the, all the simple sugars, but yeah, the idea that and this is maybe it's a question for, you know, for all of us too, if the, if the hard wiring is, is so powerful, with, which is what Louis and I have, have written throughout the book, then, you know, as you say, what, what are, how do you overcome it? And I guess the, what we said in the book too, is that, the idea that you can just simply overcome this, it may be, may be naive, actually, because we are pushing against, you know, uh, millions of years of, of evolutionary history, and it's so strong. So as Louis mentioned, we, we almost need patches uh, or, or that updated software patch uh, to, get, to get around it. And uh, that's what we put in the last chapter we talked about, uh, and Louis mentioned it as well, coming out of the, uh, of the, of the Black Plague was the Renaissance. And, and the idea that you can feed your feed this hardwiring in a in a positive way, and so this gets into kind of flipping the you know flipping the conversation around from a, a avoidance of of bad things um, to how do we feed our hardwiring in a in a positive way, and I think that's a that's a really important question. So we looked at the Renaissance and say, hey, there was you know there's amazing art, science, you know, philosophy, medicine breakthroughs at that time. Um, and life was improving dramatically and it was feeding our, our, our hardwiring and all that dopamine that we would get from all that bad stuff is actually being fed in a, in a positive way as well. And we've seen this with athletes. I have a athletic background too, where there is this, uh, almost an insufferable discipline to, to get through these workouts. Um, but then on the flip side, there is an allowance for reward that uh, alleviates some of the willpower that took for them to get through that in the first place. And that replenishes that, that gas tank and allows them to then do another one of these, you know, grueling workouts. So it's about understanding our evolutionary hardwiring in it, it, to the degree that we can um, work with it uh, instead of against it. And I think that's, that's part of the core message for us as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's definitely what we focus on in our health coach training program is how to, you know, understand our hardwiring and our, our, our behavioral biases and um, not, you know, it's almost like an Aikido approach like that you're mm -hmm. talking about, you know, not to oppose force with force, but to kind of learn to flow with it and redirect it in more positive directions. Um, I, I think that's really the only hope that we have, because if you, as it, almost anybody who's ever followed, you know, like a very calorie restricted diet or any kind of thing that goes directly against our evolutionary programming, you know, you can do it for varying lengths of time, depending on your willpower, but it's, you know, it's not going to be a long-term solution. And, and as you pointed out, um, willpower is a, is a limited resource and it, it mm -hmm. tends to decline, um, you know, with stress and other, other things. So if, if we try to set, up the solution to the problem is just being more willpower, more effort. We're pretty much doomed to fail. Totally agree. Absolutely. So I want to talk a little bit um, for the just remaining a few minutes that we have about um, children's health. I, I'm quite concerned, as I'm sure both both of you are, with the impact that the pandemic uh, is having, both in the immediate term and also in the medium to longer term on kids. Um, we were already you know, arguably experiencing an epidemic of behavioral and mental health disorders in kids. There are uh, more prescriptions for antipsychotic medications than there are people in the U.S., one in 10 uh, Americans overall taking antidepressants. Uh, lots and lots of kids, uh, a growing number of kids are, are um, being prescribed medic you know, medication for behavioral and mental health disorders. And now we're in a situation where many kids are 
doing school online with Zoom. They're isolated from their uh, peers and they're not getting outside and you know getting exercise like they normally would. So uh, yeah, let's talk a little bit about both the longer term issue with kids and then how COVID is contributing to this and maybe some things that parents might consider uh, as a way of protecting the health of their children. Well, okay. yeah, I can ahead. start and Rob uh, can wrap up on this one just to say a few things. So parents should know that, uh, you know, uh, pediatric societies around the world uh, really warn parents not to introduce any sort of electronic gadgetry before the age of, uh, you know, two. So between 18 and 24 months should be the limit of when you can introduce uh, gadgets. And I see it, unfortunately, with kids in our emergency department that are screaming, and then your know, parents pull out these devices, and the kids become fixated, and uh, almost entranced by them. The other thing is, you know, you got to make absolutely sure that you're spending the time with kids. I mean, if you're going to have kids, you need to spend time with them, you need to read, you need to, you know, show them stuff, you need to go around, you need to have downtime, you need to make sure that they get outside in nature, you need to make sure that they're you know, properly nourished and protected. And they've got those 40 important adults around their lives as well. And we don't do that, unfortunately. And so um, I think we're over-medicating our kids. I think we're over-diagnosing our kids. And I think exposure at an early age is rewiring the circuitry of the brains. You know, most kids go to school and you ask them at the end of the day, how was school boring? What did you learn? Nothing. Well, can it be that we have the same curriculum across the country that's not meeting the needs of our kids? You know, I don't know if you've heard of Indigo schools, but uh, Indigo mm -hmm. schools are, are schools that really aren't schools and that allow children to learn by their inquisitiveness. And we've got to do a far better job in how we're raising the next generation of kids because as a university professor, I can tell you, these kids are stressed to the max. Yeah, I'll just finish off the... Uh onto what Louis was saying there. The, uh, you know, we looked at in the book, we talk about some of the worst cases uh, imaginable uh, for stress for kids, you know, go, like, like growing up in war, for example. So UNICEF says about one in 10 kids globally grows up in a, in a conflict zone. Uh, we see this in Syria. So there are kids that have never known a day in their life without, without war. Uh, so we, we look at those, we look at cases uh, where kids have been taken from their homes, um, really high stress, stress stuff, and, and how that affects the brain and especially the development, that architecture that Louis was mentioning where the brain, you know, starts developing from the bottom up towards the, the, the forebrain. So you've got that, you know, the, the oldest part of that brain, the hind brain, and then, you know, the midbrain, the forebrain, and that forebrain being the most, um, you know, the most humans uh, and, and advanced part of the brain in the sense that it develops late and that's where our decision-making and judgment is. Uh, but that is, uh, that gets interrupted. And, and Louis mentioned it actually can change the, the architecture and the functioning of parts of the brain where we get the, the kids get stuck in it in a fight or flight response because of the toxic stress environment now we we now we don't want to compare modern kids on screens to those who grew up in war but the same parts of the brain are also being affected by very flashy screens uh, screens that are moving where the imagery on the screen is moving at a pace that is much faster than real life and the brain is struggling the young brain is struggling to make sense and keep up with this this strange world on the screen, and they get stuck in this kind of fight or flight response. And what we see in kids that have grown up in conflict zones is that it can affect them for their whole life. So, you know, 60 years later, um, they can have even their, their stature, their height um, can be affected. All sorts of parameters that uh, and metrics of health can, can be affected as well. So, so this is a, a big problem that we have to deal with. Now we throw on top of that, uh, what's happening in teens and adolescents with the way that we communicate on social media and how important it is to have that social comparison. It's even changing the way that we communicate. So if you have a face-to-face -face conversation, there's a fairly high percentage of that conversation where you are actually generally interested in what the person has to say to you about themselves. So you have that exchange. And that is how we have been for, for millions of years, uh, with the way that we communicate on social media, which is becoming a, a primary way of we're communicating. And as you say, Chris, uh, especially during COVID for kids, uh, now that that two-way conversation changes to where it's about 80% me and about 20% you. 
And again, that starts to exaggerate the, uh, the way that we commute, uh, the importance of the self and how that we, you know, communicate and, and it's, it's actually damaging the ability for us to communicate with each other in, in a, in a, you know, in a proper and you know functioning environment, so it's uh, so these are also going to be playing out in in, a, in the long term, and we have to get our we have to get our arms around this and be able to to manage it more effectively. I just want to add one thing. Uh, you know, you can correlate the number of adverse childhood experiences with uh, problems of adults later on in life, and in the emergency department, I don't have to ask too many questions to find out why adults are there. I I, I probe back and find out how many bad, adverse, you know, childhood experiences mm -hmm. they had. And there's a direct correlation between the two. And we're not talking enough about that. Fraser Mustard, a Canadian physician, has been talking about this. You know, he's gone now, but he's been talking about this for, for years. And yet, you know, policymakers don't understand this notion that what happens to a child early in their life uh, is going to have an impact on them when they're an adult. Yes. And even in utero now, we know. It Absolutely. Back Epigenesis. That far and and gen generations back. Uh, doctors Barrett and Francis Scuddy, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show. This is really fascinating conversation. I know, I know the listeners have really, will really appreciate it. So the book is called Hardwired, How Our Instincts to Be Healthy Are Making Us Sick. Um, it's on Amazon. Anything else, uh, any other places they, uh, listeners can go to learn more about you guys and your work? Uh, our websites. Um, so uh, Louis' website is uh, www.drlou.ca, uh, and mine is um, www.drrobertbarrett.com. And that's Dr. Dr. Yeah. Yes. Great. Thanks, thanks, Chris. And thanks, everyone, for listening. Keep sending your questions in, chriscresser.com slash podcast question. We'll talk to you next time. That's the end of this episode of Revolution Health Radio. If you appreciate the show and want to help me create a healthier and happier world, please head over to iTunes and leave us a review. They really do make a difference. If you'd like to ask a question for me to answer on a future episode, you can do that at chriscresser.com slash podcast question. You can also leave a suggestion for someone you'd like me to interview there. If you're on social media, you can follow me at twitter.com slash chriscresser or facebook.com slash chriscresserlac. I post a lot of articles and research that I do throughout the week there that never makes it to the blog or podcast, so it's a great way to stay abreast of the latest developments. Thanks so much for listening. Talk to you next time.